Yeah, hi. I hope uh, that you still have some energy for this last talk. Um, I'm Niels. I'm a PhD student in the Digital Circuits group of ETH Zurich. And um, yeah, that means I'm a hardware guy. So um, I'm learning a lot today. And I'm also happy to be able to share our interdisciplinary work on prevention of microarchitectural timing channels. So you all might recognize these headlines from a few years ago about the spectre attacks. As Gernot already mentioned before, um, a spectre attack is a combination of speculative uh, execution and the COVID channel. Um, and today I will focus on the latter, on the covert channel part of this um, attack. Um, to explain what a covert channel or more specifically a timing channel in our case is, um, let's picture the following um, setup. We have two applications concurrently running on our uh, platform and both applications are divided or isolated from each other um, by the supervisor, the operating system, using conventional mechanisms like uh, memory protection. And of course, they run on the, uh, on, the, on the same hardware. Now, there is one problem to this abstraction level, which is that um, the hardware contains microarchitectural states. Um, and this microarchitectural state could, for instance, be um, caches or branch predictors, um, TLBs, and all of the state has, or all of this state that is relevant to us has one common or two common properties. The first one is that uh, it depends on previous execution. And the second property is that it has an impact on the future timing of, uh, of execution. So this can actually be used to, um, to construct a communication channel between both applications. And we, de uh, we do so by, um, by embedding a secret S in application A and, um, and a Trojan. So this um, could also be, as also mentioned by Gernot before, um, also be innocent gadget code in a spectral attack, but we focus on the worst case because if we can solve the worst case, we can also solve um, any other case. And uh, this Trojan now tries to communicate the secret to the application. And to do that, it indirectly modifies the microarchitectural state depending on that secret. So this can be seen here on the x-axis. Um, in this example, it can encode a secret from 0 to 5. And now the spy gets to run and it measures its own execution time. And what can be observed um, for a covert channel is that there is a correlation. So, um, for instance, the, if a Trojan would only would evict um, or would not use the cache at all, meaning it would encode as a secret zero, the spy would observe so by being fast. However, if the Trojan heavily uses the microarchitecture and um, um, yeah, evicts the spy's data and places its own dirty data, then the spy's execution time um, increases correspondingly. And whenever we have such a correlation, so in this case, if the spy observes an execution time of 40, the secret would be 4, um, we say that we have a channel. Um, now, how can we solve this? And <laughs> Gernot also um, already hinted at that. Um, basically, um, one approach that we are trying to follow is to partition all shared hardware resources. This can be done either spatially um, by cache coloring or temporally by bringing the microarchitecture into a predefined state on a context switch. And uh, the goal of this is that the execution time of the spy no longer corresponds to the um, secrets in the application, uh, in the um, Trojan's application space. So, um, since I'm a hardware guy, I have to talk a bit about hardware now. 
and um, I want to start by introducing CVA6, formerly known as Ariane. So if I um, use this bo or both names, um, they can be used interchangeably. So if I use one or the other, I mean the same thing. Um, CVA6 is an open source 64-bit application class uh, RISC-V processor. Um, which means that it can boot uh, Linux or SEL4. And it was developed uh, by our group at ETH. Um, since, a, since I think uh, two years ago, it, um, it was transitioned to the open hardware group um, who now own and maintain it. Um, yeah, and um, Ariana is widely used in academia and industry today. Um, one nice thing about Ariana is that it can be run in RTL simulation, which allows for a very fast uh, turnaround time. Um, however, it, the simulation takes uh, longer, so we achieve uh, something like a few kilohertz in RTL simulation. We can also map it uh, onto an FPGA for faster execution, but a slightly longer um, turnaround or significantly longer turnaround time. Um, but here we actually can boot an operating system like Linux in um, half, half a minute, uh, approximately. Um, and finally, it has also been taped out um, many times on several chips. Um, yeah, so it uh, has also been proven to work in uh, silicon. Now, I am going to show you how, or yeah, how we measure these timing channels on uh, CVA6, and we start by um, by mapping CVA6 onto an FPGA as our hardware platform. We run um, SEL4 as um, as an operating system. Um, I think I don't need to explain much about that, um, un except for that we use an experimental version with uh, time protection support. And on top of that, we run Channel Bench as an uh, application, or as, actually as two uh, threads, one Trojan and one Spy, from the illustration I showed you before. And um, they are separated or isolated by SEL4 and um, try to communicate with each other. So how, how did the results look like on this, uh, on this platform? This is um, a so-called channel matrix for an execution of uh, 10 million, no, sorry, 1 million samples. Um, so how, how to understand this? On the x-axis, you can see the secret that was, um, that the Trojan wants to communicate to the spy. Um, in this case, the secret can range from 0 to 256, which is the number of uh, cache sets in our L1 data cache. And um, the secret dictates how many of these cache lines the Trojan evicts. And then once the spy executes, it um, loads from each cache set and measures the overall execution time. And the more cache sets were evicted by the Trojan, the more, uh, longer is the execution time measured by the spy. Um, so the most important takeaway here is the channel is visible through um, a horizontal um, difference, uh, which is a correlation between the secret and the time. So for instance, if the spy measures an execution time of 86,000 cycles, um, it can infer with a fairly high certainty that um, the secret was 200. That was encoded by the Trojan. And to support this, we also have a numerical result, which is the mutual information, M. And it gives us a sense of the capacity of this information channel. So with each um, iteration of this measurement, we can, in theory, communicate uh, 1.6 um, bytes. But we are not um, interested in optimizing this here. We just want to um, remove it. Um, but this uh, mutual information always has to be seen um, in relation to the corresponding M0 value, which is the zero leakage upper bound. And it basically characterizes the noise uh, for the given measurement. Good. Now let's look at um, mitigation or prevention strategies. 
So the first, um, first we wanted to, or we tried to, to prevent these timing channels using existing, um, existing architectural um, means. Um, so our solution was to, to prime, to have, or to let SDL4 prime the data cache twice on each uh, context um, switch. So that means that the kernel basically overrides everything that was uh, previously stored in the cache. But we found that this is not um, super effective. So it is observable that we can, so that the um, resulting um, difference is less or the range of values. So if you look at the, at the Y axis, it's significantly reduced, but we still see some horizontal uh, patterns due to some uh, several microarchitectural components that the operating system has no control over. So the conclusion of this experiment was that we need hardware support. And uh, for that, now we are coming back to the title of this uh, presentation. Um, we proposed the fence T instruction, the temporal fence instruction. And this fence T instruction, once committed, um, clears all the microarchitectural components that are targeted by our attacks. So the, uh, the data cache example from before was just one example, but uh, you could do the same, or we actually also do the same experiment with um, several other components that are marked um, or highlighted in blue here. And now these are cleared on a context switch um, using this temporal fence instruction. However, what was uh, very interesting to observe was that while we almost have flat lines here, there are still some remaining patterns, horizontal patterns. So these are very small. And that's also reflected in the mutual information, which is just a couple of millibits uh, above the zero leakage upper bound. But in theory, it will still allow for transferring um, data or information. And our goal was to prevent um, those timing channels altogether. So we had another look um, at the microarchitecture. And um, yeah, dove a bit deeper into the implementation and actually found several components into, uh, inside the microarchitecture that are also state holding um, and have a timing impact. And those, uh, these are just a, a couple of examples. So there's, uh, for instance, in the caches, there are LFSRs, linear feedback shift registers, that uh, dictate the um, cache eviction policy or memory arbiters that contain round-robin arbiters. So these all contain states and have an impact on the timing of future instructions. So we continued by clearing these as well on a context switch. And at first things looked uh, good, but then um, eventually we still saw some residual channels um, occurring occasionally. So we continued to investigate uh, further and further and Eventually, after, <laughs> after um, some time, um, we decided that we have to approach this differently. Um, and we, like, uh, instead of trying to look for components that might uh, leak data, um, which is a, basically a blacklist approach, um, we try to follow a whitelist approach where, per default, we reset everything, the entire core, except uh, for a few manually selected components that are required for architectural um, correct or for functional correctness. So those are the architectural components that can be controlled and observed directly from software. And in the case of Ariane, those are exactly the register files and the controller. Um, now the implementation goes a bit further. Um, I will ju just to give you an idea how, how this actually works in hardware. Um, so first we need to save the program counter so that we can uh, continue execution after this micro reset. Um, second, we need to write back all dirty um, states and dirty data that might be in flight. So most prominently also in the CVA6 example, those are the dirty cache lines um, in the right back cache. Um, third, we need to drain pending transactions. This is also an important requirement because um, if 
the core is reset while there are still some transactions in flight, some AXI transactions. So uh, we are still waiting for a, um, for a response. Um, while we reset, then this response comes as we get out of reset and um, the core doesn't know what to do with it. And basically it's a violation of the AXI protocol. Um, yeah, so that's also important also to um, preserve the data and not um, lose anything from the previous step. Um, some components need to be cleared manually um, by an FSM, for instance, SRAMs, they don't have uh, a reset input. Um, then we can actually assert this micro reset, so the, um, the signal that clears all on-core flip-flops. And finally, we can continue the execution from the previously saved uh, program counter. And the result is um, actually a, a very flat um, channel, um, which means that there is no information leakage uh, possible anymore. The small um, horizontal differences here, the small patterns here are noise. And we can actually prove this by running the experiment several times, seeing that there are no consistent patterns. And also by looking at the mutual information below, which is below the zero leakage upper bound. Um, but the journey doesn't stop here. Um, just to give another example of uh, what still needs to be addressed or what was actually addressed uh, later on, uh, which is the, the context switch latency itself. Um, so the following setup, um, we have a Trojan again that reads and writes or writes to the cache. And the number of cache sets it writes to um, are, again, the secret on the x-axis. Um, the spy reads the cycle counter just before it was evicted by the operating system. And then again, after it got um, scheduled uh, again and returned to execution. And this depth difference here um, is the observation on the y-axis. And here we can already see that uh, the context switch latency, so the time slices are, um, um, are constant, but the context switch latency um, depends on the state of the microarchitecture, so what the Trojan previously did. And um, thus, it takes longer for, the, for SAL4 to switch the context if um, the microarchitectural state is dirty, like if the L1 data cache is dirty in this case, because it just executes slower. Um, and this difference can be observed by the spy, as you can see here on the left. Um, so there is, again, a very clear correlation. Now, <laughs> once we introduce uh, fence T, it actually gets worse. Um, Gernot also hinted at this before. Because additionally to the increased um, context switch latency due to the um, execution itself of the of the kernel, we also um, have a dependence of the delay of fence T um, with respect to the um, secret um, or the previous execution of the Trojan. So this adds to this, and um, here we can see an almost perfect um, communication channel very close to the theoretic maximum of uh, eight, uh, eight bit per uh, transfer. Um, so how we address this in, in, in our work is by time padding. So basically we um, try to figure out what the worst case execution time is um, of, the, of the context switch routine. Um, in our case, that is for fully dirty caches. And then we always pad um, to this interval with respect to the clint timer interrupt. Um, why the clint timer interrupt? Because this is um, basically the only um, constant in our system. Everything else, already the first couple of the cycles um, that, the, um, that the kernel executes, can be influenced by, um, by previous execution and by the microarchitectural state. Um, but the clean time interrupt is guaranteed to come at a constant uh, frequency. So we, we pad to that. And 
yeah, can see that the resulting channel is uh, is flat. Now you might wonder, okay, flushing the caches, padding on a context switch, that sounds expensive. And um, yeah, we try to find out how expensive exactly. So we did the following experiment. We um, instantiated two threads one benchmark thread running splash two benchmarks and one idle thread that did nothing. And um, the OS would switch between these two threads. Um, we have a one gigahertz system clock for our system, which is what Ariana was designed for, and a 10 millisecond time slice. So at each 10 milliseconds, we switch between the benchmark and the idle thread. Yeah, so that's the correspondence of the time slice um, interval with the system clock. And um, those, here you can see the, um, uh, the overheads that were measured on the Splash 2 benchmark. Um, on average, it's 0.7% uh, on both cache art architectures. And furthermore, Synthesizing uh, the changes in GF22 FDX uh, technology at one gigahertz shows that there are negligible hardware costs by adding this instruction. So to conclude, um, the existing ISA uh, cannot prevent timing channels. Uh, it is impossible to do so. Um, however, by introducing a single instruction uh, we can enable temporal partitioning of the hardware. So now the operating system has the means to control the microarchitectural state. Um, furthermore, micro resets is a systematic and straightforward implementation of FENST. And it comes at negligible hardware costs and a 0.7% um, average performance impact. But we also saw that time protection is a system-wide challenge. So it's great that um, we can sit here together and discuss uh, these issues because they cannot be addressed only in hardware or only in software. This is really one um, topic where we, we need to, to work together. Um, and finally, um, we are also contributing to the RISC-V spec. So um, the temporal fence is making its way into the RISC-V spec. Um, actually, we have already, um, or there, there, there is already a micro architectural side channel special interest group by Risk Five, and um, we are currently in the process of transforming this or um, evolving a micro architectural side channel resistant instruction spans task group. So that's the next level of escalation in the Risk Five um, hierarchy, and this is the path towards making. This mechanism, maybe with a different semantic, maybe it won't be called FENST anymore, but um, making this part of the Risk V spec. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Nils. Any questions? Lots of questions. Uh, let me start from the back this time. I didn't see anyone further back, did I? <laughs> oh, yes, I did. Wait. <laughs> hey, uh, um, I have a million questions, but I, yeah, we can talk later. One question is, you said you moved from a um, whitelist approach to a, or a blacklist approach to a whitelist approach. Uh, and you um, blocked off like almost the entire system apart from a few. Did you then um, like, to add some more things to the whitelist and then see if, if, if the channels came back or did you just leave it at the original, like, let's let's get rid of everything approach? Yeah, yeah, it's it was a second. So um, our goal was to to prevent these channels from, from happening uh, fundamentally. And yeah, we, 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 we reached that goal by, um, uh, by implementing micro resets. So yeah, it, it would be interesting though to, uh, to find out what exactly um, has to be um, included in this operation, but um, it's also important to note or to stress that this is something uh, manual. So we cannot. Uh, so as soon as uh, as there is not a system anymore, we also 
uh, lose confidence that we actually covered everything. Um, yeah. So I think that was also one of the takeaways uh, of this work. All right, who's next? Anyone here? You, you. All right. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for this presentation. I, I would like to ask uh, John back slide and uh, can you describe a little bit, yeah, this one, uh, what mm -hmm. was the, how to say, test bed, test bench, how did you measure it? Uh, because why I'm asking it, because Intel Corporation accept, uh, how to say, suppose that their fixes in firmware for their processors will take about 30% degradation, but you did measure it just like less than 1% degradation mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not super sure about the implementation differences. Um, so of course, uh, the overhead that we measure strongly depends on uh, our exper experimentational setup and on the yeah. test benches that or on the benchmarks that we use. Um, Gernot, do you want to? Yeah. Okay, I can only speculate here, but um, knowing Intel, their approach is they want to do everything in hardware and keep the OS out be because they look at everything as a hardware problem. And if you do that, it's inevitably you overshoot. Yeah. You, that Niels was totally spot on in the sense that this is a co-design problem. You need to have the hardware and the OS cooperating. Otherwise you either miss the goal or you just destroy performance. Um, and yeah. regarding the distribution uh, why it is biased initial distribution um it looks like it should be kind of normal distribution but it's okay no no, no those are, okay so maybe that's uh, um uh, that's an interpretation issue so these are different no, benchmarks I'm not no i'm not talking about that uh -huh. I'm, I'm, I'm talking the probability distribution the first the first one probability distribution the first have. one uh, is it possible to do this faster? Yeah, no, no. This, this ah. yeah, give it back. This, this one, un, un, yes. Un, 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 you, you see, it's kind of biased, and uh, the question is, did you check why it is biased? Um, do you mean by bias um, on the left side or? Yeah, on the left side. Um, the maximum of the distribution in, in, is not on the middle of the distribution. It's actually biased to the to the uh -huh. bottom of the distribution. What is the reason um, I mean, this behavior? is this is really um, a manual um, cut of the of the entire set. So there are also some outliers um, mm -hmm. um, above and below. So that's uh, um, this is just how like it could be skewed due to the proportions how it's showed here. But um, the the intervals um, are what really matter, and the general uh, linear um, correlation. So there is some noise. Which is um, presumably you, also you, you 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 can do some correlation stuff if you suppose that you know uh, the distribution. I mean, yeah. a, a linear some linear regression should be supposed that you have normal distribution. That's what I'm asking. But yeah. So I I can give you an answer to that specific question. Yeah. Why is this not the vertical slices are distributions, right? And why are they not normal and symmetric or similar? Well, there are multiple components that are contributing to what appears as noise here. They are not independent, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's yeah. why it doesn't form a normal distribution when you add them. Yeah. That's, that's basically the answer. Yeah. Okay. I see one over there. Thank you, Sebastian Jester, Cyber Agentur. I was wondering, you've shown empirically that certain Trojans and certain spies don't produce a correlation. Can you show formally that there are no yeah. attacks? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so that's also one of the current research topics that are open. Um, so um, the, I think this is one of the major challenges also um, also when talk or in these risk five uh, meetings, like how can we be sure that um, an implementation really implements this correctly? And um, and gives us the the very strict uh, requirements that we need. And indeed, there are some um, 
collaborations also with um, Princeton and uh, UCSD. Um, and they have more expertise on formal hardware verification and uh, and we are looking into into ways how to um, how to prove this more formally so perhaps that's a different set of terminology than um, what is what most of you are used to here in this in the context of SEL4 but uh, yeah so that's basically a valid point and uh, ongoing research yes uh, thanks for the very interesting talk um, does this approach, if, is this a single core system at the moment? Yeah. And are you able to use effectively the same strategy for multi-core when there's like shared architecture between the cores or is there going to need to be a different instruction or like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so that's, um, okay. So there, there are two points to that, uh, to the answer of this question. So the first point is that um, we do differentiate between um, spatial and temporal partitioning. Um, so in our setup, um, the, the general rule or goal is to temporally partition on core resources because they usually live for a short um, time period and, um, and are quite small. But, um, and then for off-core resources uh, that would be shared by multiple cores, um, those are um, partitioned spatially using cache coloring um, or yeah, maybe in the future even uh, more, um, yeah. And so is that every off-core resource is able to be partitioned spatially? Um, not yet. That's also part, uh, or that's also future research. So we explicitly only, um, uh, look at the uh, the core, the on-core state. Um, so, for instance, you have uh, memory uh, interconnects um, and other shared components. Um, I think that still needs need to be addressed. Yeah. So, I just to segue from your from from your question there, there are off-core resources which you will never be able to spatially partition mm -hmm. because, for example, arbitration on a common interconnect. And mm -hmm. these will need to be temporally partitioned exactly and you'll need a mechanism something like this yeah this is something uh actually really really interesting to look at mm -hmm. and i have a platform for you to experiment on. <laughs> we should talk okay i think we should we should talk later but that's a that's a very good point um so um, that's also one of the goals of um of the risk five um committee they want to come up with a general solution and they don't want to mandate that each implementation needs to spatially partition these components, temporarily partition these, but actually the semantics they came up with, the preliminary semantics, of course, um, are using security identifiers, and then the implementation can basically um, decide whether on a switch between security identifiers, it clears components or it um, uh, yeah, makes sure to spatially partition them. All right. So we're a little bit over time, but we've got two more questions. So I'm going to let the last two people ask. Yeah. Um, so my question was, you have this really great number of less than a percent hardware overhead. Mm -hmm. How much does that depend on the risk five ISA or even the implementation of the core or to ask more courageously, could you retrofit this to say X86 to just go full crazy <laughs> okay so um first to clarify the 0.7 percent were the um benchmark or the software execution performance overheads not the hardware overheads um, but you had but, a hardware overhead yeah yeah no, the no. hardware ne uh, overhead was negligible so it was less ah, than even less okay um so it was was a couple of kilogates which is um yeah an order or several orders of magnitude lower than the entire core and within the uncertainty interval of a synthesis, which is not uh, deterministic. Yeah. Um, yeah, but um, that's also a very interesting question. I mean, conceptually, it could be applied to more complex um, cores and um, architectures as well. Um, but of course, there are then also uh, new challenges. For instance, um, some cores and architectures, they don't even allow for a reset. They don't even have a um, a system reset um, or something. Some components they are not uh, connected to a reset, so that's um, 
So there might be some uh, challenges there, but we're looking into that as well. All right, last question. So for your performance overhead, 0.7%, that was with 10 milliseconds time slice. Yes. Did you try other time slices? I wouldn't be surprised if you go to one millisecond, there would be 7% then. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I did not, uh, to be honest. It would for sure increase, um, but maybe also to, to stress this, I forgot to mention it. Um, the One of the reasons why we observe such such a low or relatively low performance overhead is that um, lots of um, what we do can be hidden um, by um, what the core eventually has to do anyways. So if it, if it contains dirty data and a different, like another application runs, at some point it needs to write this back and this will take for a while. And then when switching back to the previous application, um, we'll find the, the cache is cold. So this will also introduce a whole overhead. So ideally, um, everything that we do can be fully hidden, but it, of course it depends on, on the usage and on the use case. All right. Thanks, Niels.